this definitely is not like any other church that I've pastored. Well, that, that's true. I mean, most of the time <clears throat> when I stand up, I'm trying to wake them up. And you are awake and alive, and that's, uh, that's good. Now let's see if I can do what I'm supposed to do. When I grew up in a small town in West Virginia, my, um, <clears throat> my dad wasn't a, wasn't a big churchgoer, and my mother, uh, it, and I will say this with all respect for her, my mother was an alcoholic. So uh, when we had Thanksgiving dinner, we went to my grandmother's house, and it was uh, a, a wonderful thing because there it was kind of safe and it was nice and all of that. But my, my Aunt Ruby uh, uh, would be the one who would, when it was time to eat, would say, who's going to say the blessing? Yeah. Who's going to say the blessing? Well, my, that was when everybody's heads bowed, not because they were ready to pray, but because they didn't want to catch eye contact with her because that would have meant you would say the blessing. Well, evidently, God told her something before I knew it because she began to call on me to pray. Who's going to say the blessing? Okay, I guess I will. And so I prayed. That's my question for you this morning. Who's going to say the blessing? I heard a story once about a little girl that went to worship. She went to worship every Sunday, and she sat by herself except with some of her friends. Her parents never came with her. Never. Um, her parents were well known in the community because they, they ran a business and they uh, had great parties and people would come to the parties because they were recruiting them for the business. Uh, one Sunday, sitting where she usually sat, the pastor looked back and there were her parents. They were sitting with her. There came to the end of the service, and there was an invitation to come to Jesus. There was an invitation to give your life to Christ, and they stepped forward and said, Today we want to do this. Well, the pastor was taken back. They hadn't been there before. They were there with her for the first time. So he wanted to know whether it was his preaching. Was it my sermon that brought you up? You know, And they said, No, but we'll tell you what it was. Last night, when we had one of our parties... We invited people from all around because we need to make the relationships so that we can get them into the business, so we can uh, do the work we need to do. We're in the middle of our, um, uh, of our party, and we must have made too much noise because Susie, who had already been put to bed, came down the stairs, and she saw the table full of food, and she said, oh, goody, I can say the blessing. And she said, God is great, God is good, and we thank him for our food. By his hands we are fed. Give us, Lord, our daily bread. And then she said, see you in the morning, Mommy and Daddy, when you take me to church. As the story is, they everybody began to look at their watch and say, well, I think it's time to go home. So mom and dad, when they're cleaning up the mess, picking up the cups and the plates and the napkins, and they're getting ready to put things away, they look at each other and at the same time saying, what are we doing? Let's go with Susie tomorrow. And so we're here today, they said, because of Susie. Now what did Susie do? She said the blessing. She said the blessing, and my question is, who's going to say the blessing? So when I hear, I want you to hear a blessing now from, from the scripture. This is a blessing that, um, that the Israelite people received because, well, they're in, this is what's happened. They are in exile. They've been disobedient. They are not with the people that they want to be with. They are dispersed, and God says to Moses, Moses, I want you to tell Aaron and his descendants to bless my people. This comes from Numbers, the, eighth, uh, the, the sixth chapter, beginning at the, uh, 
22nd verse. I just wear these because I see some of you wearing them. Okay. <laughs> the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and his son, saying, Thus you shall bless the Israelites. You shall say to them, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you, be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. So they shall put my name on the Israelites, and I will bless them. The Israelites have been disobedient, and here is God saying to Moses, Moses, I want you to bless my people. Now let's look at the word blessing just for a minute. I think we have... We have lowered the word blessing to something less than what it really is. Because when we talk about blessing, we talk about having something good done to us. It's much bigger than that. It means to be set upon the right path in such a way that you become who God has intended for you to be. That you've been set on the right path in such a way that you become who God intends for you to be. So it's not about what you get or, or what you have or how much more you might expect. It is that when you're in God's favor, God is putting you on the right path to become who God intended for you to be. So here are these Israelite people who are off the path. The Israelite people who have been disobedient. And God says, Moses, I want you to tell Aaron, and I want you to take all of Aaron's descendants, and I want you to tell the Israelite people, I am ready to put them on the right path so they can be who they were created to be. That's what this story is about. Bless those Israelites, set them on that path, and then not only bless them, but tell them I'll protect them. It says, not only bless you, but keep you. I will protect them. God not only provides, God watches over us. So as you're being set on the right path, I'll protect you. So you don't have to worry about doing something that's going to be embarrassing, or you're not going to have to worry about doing something that's going to be wrong, because I'll be with you and I'll protect you. And then it says, the Lord make his face to shine upon you. The implication is, when God's face shines upon you, we've just heard, testimonies of that. When God's face shines upon you, you're able to walk. When God's face shines upon you, you're released from prison. When God's face shines upon you, but it's in the context of being set on the right path to become who you're supposed to be under God's protection, and then God's face shines upon you in God's favor, and then God is gracious unto you. It's all about grace. What I've learned in my life not only in 40 years of ministry, but of 60 years of living this life, is that God does not deal with us according to our sin. Now, you know the word sin means to miss the point. God does not deal with us in our missing the point. Missing the point means our misunderstanding. God doesn't deal with us in our misunderstandings. God deals with us in setting us on the right path to become who we were created to be. Now, when I was growing up, my father was my hero. That may be the way it is with all boys, I don't know. But for me, I, I wanted my dad to be proud of me. I uh, didn't want him to be ashamed of me. I wanted him to think of me as, as well, as bright as his son. <laughs> I would be his favorite child. Uh, I didn't make any difference. He played football. I played football. In 1939, he kicked a ball barefooted. He punted a ball barefooted at a Milton High School football game. And the Huntington Herald Dispatch in Huntington, West Virginia, took his picture. It was put on the wall of Milton High School, where 30 years later, I came by. His coach... John Cox was my assistant principal. To my dad, he was called Colonel, uh, to my dad, he was called Coach Cox. To me, we called him Colonel Cox, not to his face, of course. <laughs> he was the assistant principal. 
he grabbed me one day walking down the hall, and he said, Bice, you going to play football like your dad? And I said, yes, I'm going to play football. He said, are you going to punt like your dad? I said, no, sir, I can't kick the ball the way he did. Well, what position are you going to play, son? I said, well, I'm going to be a running back. He said, everybody wants to be a running back, son. That's a glory position. What makes you think you can be a running back? I said, I said Mr. Cox, I hate contact. You give me the ball, I'll score every time. My dad played basketball in high school. He played basketball at Marshall College, now Marshall University. He played on a 1946 NIA, NIA championship team in St. Louis. I used to wear his uniform to practice in junior high school because I thought it would make me play better. If he didn't come to a game, I was doing double-doubles before double-doubles were popular. But if he came to a game, the ball bounced off my foot, off my knee. He'd go out of bounds. Coach said, your, your, your dad here tonight, Bias? I'd say, yeah. He said, well, why don't you just start on the bench, son? <laughs> I just wanted my dad to be proud. He built houses. He built churches. He built some of the buildings at Marshall uh, University. Uh, I used to go on dates and take, take my date around and say, my dad built this house, my dad built this building, my dad built this. The only thing he ever wanted me to do was learn to lay brick, because if I could lay brick, he said, you can do anything. If nothing else works, you can always lay brick. That's the one thing I didn't learn to do. I think it was working with him on Saturdays after football games, carrying mortar, mortar mud up a ladder that I decided God was calling me to ministry, I think. <laughs> At age 24, I'd already been a pastor for four years. I had already been through college and seminary. My mother called me and said, I need to talk to you. So I drove to her house, sat at the kitchen table, and she explained to me, it took her two hours to do it, she explained to me that this man who I'd spent all of my time up to this point proving to him that I was worthy of his love, that he could be proud of me, he didn't have to be ashamed of me, had adopted me when I was nine months old. He had chosen me to be his son. He had given me his name. He had loved me from the beginning. There was nothing I could do about it. He didn't care whether I played football, basketball, or laid a brick. He had already chosen me to love me. And the, a, 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 and the power of God's grace came rushing into my life at that moment because that's what God has done with all of us. God's chosen us, has given us a name, has claimed us as his children, and the only thing we can do about it is accept it. This is what this blessing is about. Setting us on the right path so that we're becoming who God would have us to be. He'll protect us on that path. All because he's already chosen us and loves us. Has already given us the name. God turns God's face toward us. One of the things I, I've learned out of this blessing is that in 1 Corinthians, when Paul writes to the, to the church in Corinth, he said God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. The image I have is God, the word reconciling means God hugs. God is hugging the world to himself. God embraces us with a love. In the midst of our undeserving, unearning, God has accepted us. That's another part of that image. That's part of that blessing. Can you imagine Moses saying to, to Aaron, Aaron, God has just said, even though we've been disobedient and we're not on the right path, God is saying he's hugging us into himself. God, then it says, God will give you peace. The word is shalom. This is what God desires for all of creation, a wholeness and completeness and a oneness with God. So we're back to where we started. Just to be who God created us to be. Here's the blessing. We've been wandering in the wilderness, and God comes along in Jesus Christ and says, I love you. I take you just as you are. I want to get you on the right path. You don't have to worry about it because I'm with you. I'll protect you. 
I have turned my face towards you, and we're going to make you whole. That's the part of the blessing. That's our mission, friends. As Moses and Aaron and all who followed Aaron, now you and me and the church, God has blessed us, and that ultimate blessing of God's provision is Jesus Christ. That's the ultimate blessing. And you and I have been given that blessing in abundance. Because we have been blessed, we are now to bless the people, the community, the neighborhood. We are to bless where we work and where we live. We are to bless in such a way that when people are in our presence, they can't resist the love of God that lives in us. I know a school teacher in Tennessee who teaches, who did teach in, a, in an alternative school. Now, I don't know what it is in Ohio, but in Tennessee, everyone is guaranteed an education. Even if you get kicked out of the classroom, you still are guaranteed an education. So she taught in a school where there had been students who had been, who had been expelled or kicked out because of drugs or fighting or weapons or other reasons, she taught in a school that had more than one police officer present. Now, the way, the way she did it was that uh, these were juniors and seniors in high school. She would have birthday parties for them. It was a way in which she would develop relationships. And so the kids began to expect birthday parties. So if one got a chocolate cake and another one wanted a lemon cake, they were telling her, next week's my birthday and I'd like to have a chocolate swirl cake or something. See, they were telling her. She told me about a set of twins that she had in class. They had been expelled because of their behavior in the school, and they didn't put them together in the same class in this alternative school. One was in the morning, and one was in the afternoon. So when it came time for their birthday, she bought two cakes. She had two parties, one for one in the morning and one for one in the afternoon. When the day was over, the twins came to her and they said, Thank you for the birthday party. We've never had a party before. She said, I have, it's hard to believe. You're 16 years old. Uh, We usually throw parties for first or second graders. So we've never even had a birthday cake before. And we've each had one today. She said, well, what about your parents? What about your mom and dad? Mom stays hired drunk most of the time, and we haven't seen dad in years. But the point of telling you the story is this. They looked at her and said, we wish you were our mother. Can you imagine living your life in such a way that people want to be related to you? Can you imagine the church being the kind of church that blesses the community, helps put people on the right path because of the grace of God that they say, I want to be a part of that community. That's what blessing is all about. And our mission can be found in the New Testament several places because those early Christians saw themselves so blessed that they were the evidence of the resurrection. That everywhere they went, they could say, we are the evidence that Jesus is alive and well on earth. Can you imagine blessing the world in such a way that we are the evidence of the resurrection? This may give you a couple of these. In Acts, the ninth chapter... There's a blessing for the theologically and the religiously misguided. Do you think there's anybody theologically and religiously misguided in our culture today? In the ninth chapter of Acts, you get a blessing for that because the person by the name of Saul, Saul of Tarsus, had gotten permission from the priest to go down and put an end to this little group of people who were causing problems down in Damascus. Those early Christians. And so on his way down, he is struck blind. The last thing he has in his mind is a vision of the risen Christ. And God speaks to Ananias. Now the biased version 
the biased version of this is, Ananias, I want you to go over and bless a man by the name of Saul. He's on a street called Straight, and he needs your blessing. He needs to be set on the right path. He needs to know of the grace that allows him to see my face. Now, I can imagine Ananias being like some of us, would say, now, Lord, we need to have a prayer meeting about this. <laughs> this guy was coming down to do me in. But God says through the Holy Spirit, Ananias, go over to Saul. And Ananias goes and he blesses Saul. He puts his hand on Saul's shoulder. You can read it in the ninth chapter. He calls him Brother Saul. And Saul becomes Paul the Apostle. We are here because of that blessing. We are here because of that blessing. And it's not an anger and a bitterness any longer. It becomes, it becomes a redemption, a redeemed kind of life. Where we even bless our enemies. What would happen if we began to bless not just our enemies, but our neighbors? That we began to bless the neighborhoods in Pickerington. That every time we would drive through, we would pray. That if we stopped and began to say, I'll pray for the neighbor on my left and on the one on the right and across the street and behind me, and just said, God, make me available when they're ready so I might be a blessing just as you've blessed me. How would the world change at those moments? You know, if it was good enough for Saul, maybe it would be good enough for us. Bless the people. May the Lord set you on the right path so you can become who you're supposed to be. You can go to the, even in the 8th chapter, that's another place where there was a blessing, a blessing for the marginalized, those who've been pushed off to the edges. It's the Ethiopian eunuch. In Deuteronomy 23, it says, Any man who by surgery or accident or disposition that cannot father children does not have a place in the fellowship of God is not welcome in the fellowship. A eunuch is somebody who by accident or design cannot father children, is not welcome in the, in, in, in the presence of God. I, I love this story because I'm, I'm sure that Philip grew up just the way everyone else had grown up during that time in the Jewish tradition. Don't go to Samaria. Don't go to Samaria. The people in Samaria are terrible. Don't go to Samaria. If you go to Samaria, make sure you knock the dust off your feet before you come home. Don't go to Samaria. And when the Holy Spirit comes upon Philip, where does he go? Samaria! And it's such a wonderful experience that Simon Peter and John have to go down to make sure that it's all right because those Samaritans are, are responding. And they'd say, we better go down there and find out. Philip may not be telling us the truth. And they send Philip back, and on his way back, he runs into this Ethiopian eunuch. The eunuch's reading something, reading from Isaiah. He said, what are you, what are you reading? He said, well, I'm reading about this man who's given his life he said, can you tell me who it is? He said, I can't know unless somebody tells me. Philip then tells him about Jesus. Tells him about Jesus. And then the eunuch says, well, what hinders me from being part of the fellowship? What hinders me from being baptized? Now, in my imagination, it's like this. Philip looks at him and says, they'll not like this back in Jerusalem, but I'll baptize you. The marginalized are blessed. The people who have been pushed off to the edges are now being finding their way into God's loving embrace. I know sometimes it's tough. We assume everybody knows. But the reality is most people do not know God's love that sets them on the right path to become who God would have them to be. Most of the people around us do not know. So who's going to bless them? Who's going to guide them? Who's going to mentor them like Philip did the eunuch? That's what this blessing's all about. Bless the people. The Lord makes his face to shine upon you and is gra gracious unto you. I can keep going. I'll just give you one more. The 10th chapter, you've got Cornelius, a Roman soldier. 
God sent Simon Peter over to see Cornelius. Now you've got to know that when Simon Peter preached on Pentecost, he opened up his arms and he said, this promise is for you and your children and your children's children and your children are far off. And then all of a sudden he speaks to Simon Peter and says, I want you to go over to, to uh, uh, Cornelius and tell him about this great promise. And Peter says, but Lord, I've never been in the home of an Italian in all my life. God says, well, what about Pentecost? He said, Lord, I'm just preaching. What's Simon Peter do? He goes to Cornelius' house, and the first thing he says, the 28th verse of the 10th chapter, he says, you know it's unlawful for a Jew to associate or to be in the home of a Gentile, but God has shown me that I should not call anyone profane or unclean. And he tells him about Jesus and Cornelius, and it says, all of his house. All of his house began to follow God through Jesus Christ. So just for Moses and Aaron, it's the same for the church. There's a blessing for the misguided Saul, a marginalized eunuch, an outcast Cornelius. And the blessing is always for shalom, for that wholeness and that completeness. So, here we are. Before we can bless others, we ourselves have to be blessed. We have to be equipped to receive and acknowledge the blessing of God for ourselves. We have to receive and acknowledge the blessing of God in Jesus Christ. Before we can ever go and bless, we have to be blessed. So I want you to practice. I know this isn't quite the way you think about blessing all the time, but here's the way we're going to practice blessing this morning. I want you to turn to your neighbor. I want you to look him in the face, and I want you to repeat after me. And if you have to say the same thing at the same time, it's okay because the words are the same. Just repeat after me. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Now, was that tough? Well, now that you have been blessed, you go and bless this neighborhood. You go and bless this community. You go and bless the world now. Because what would happen if we began to bless the city officials and the police officers and the firefighters? What would happen if we began to bless the homeless and those who are hungry and single mothers? What would happen if we began to bless the people that no one else wants? What would happen if we just began to bless the people that have been forgotten? What would happen? I know sometimes we usually think about blessing the down and out because we're always going to do something for the down and out. Who's going to take care of the up and out? I spent 15 years the pastor of churches of people who had so much money and had everything that they wanted and needed so socially and economically above everybody else in their minds that they had no need for anything else. Yet their need was the same. They were just as empty as the people who had nothing. The need is the same. So let's go blow, uh, bless them. Let's bless them. Let them know that there is hope. As we go out offering hope, we can let them know of this God who has worked to set them on the right path and is going to protect them so they can become all that they can be, and it's all about God's grace so that they can have a wholeness and completeness, and it comes in Jesus Christ. Let me try it just one more way. When I was a pastor at First United Methodist Church in Peoria, Peoria, Illinois, uh, one of the things I used to say, if, if you want to meet Jesus, you need to get into the neighborhood. The church was located right downtown, uh, there was no one who attended the church that lived around the church. 
if there was anyone who lived around the church, they were all people who lived in, in, in impoverished housing, and, and, and they were people that, well, they were transients. They were homeless people. And we lived right on the, uh, the church was right downtown across from the bars and from, uh, let's see, the uh, Big Al. Big Al's was a strip joint. That's where the church was. We adopted, because we, I kept saying, we need to get out into the community, we need to get out into the community. We adopted a, a, a little elementary school, uh, Irving School. Uh, when I, we started, we had 25 volunteers. When I left, there were 250 people. I'd go every week to meet with 250 students in that school. And it wasn't to do anything else other than to do what the teachers needed to have them done, have done. One day, when I was saying, we need to get, if you want to meet Jesus, get out in the community. You want to meet Jesus, get out in the community. This was where a caterpillar is located. A caterpillar manager who had retired, sat in a balcony. He's ready to, you know, to ride off in the sunset because he's got more than what anybody else would want. And he comes down and shakes my hand, and he says, I'm tired of hearing about meeting Jesus in the community. Now, you've got to know that when a pastor hears those words, it's something bad about ready to happen. And I said, what do you mean, Roy? And he said, I want to meet Jesus. And I said, what do you have in mind? And he said, well, I'm thinking that maybe the school down here needs to have a choir. They don't have any vocal music whatsoever, and I think they need to have a choir. And I said, I think that's a great idea. Do you, do you sing? No. Do you read music? No. Do you play an instrument? No. Well, how are we going to do this? He said, that's the doorway he said, that's the doorway in for us to pray with them. He said, that's all I want to do is to pray. So if we can get them together and they can practice singing, we can pray for them. And I said, okay, but Lloyd, you understand that it's a public school and we're told that we can't pray in public schools. And he said, well, I've already taken care of that. I said, what have you done? He said, I talked to the superintendent. I talked to the principal. We've gotten permission that after school, as long as the school doesn't sh sanction it, we can practice with them and we can pray with them. I said, well, let's go for it. He said, well, I've got 25 names already. I said, how'd you get those? He said, I've already talked to some of the teachers, and they've given me some students that would be good. They're going to reward the students by singing, and they're going to reward the students because we get to pray for them. Loy and his wife, Darlene, went to uh, the housing that was in South, uh, South Peoria, south side of Peoria, called Taft Homes. 25 families, knocked on their doors, got permission for the kids to sing and to meet after school and to ride a bus to concerts. They got all the permission. They, they got the people in the church who were going to help them, and they gathered them on Wednesdays, and they practiced. There was somebody that played the piano. There was somebody that was directing, and there was some other people that came that kind of heard cats because that's kind of what it was for several months. The kids had not done this before, and they were just all over the place. But then Loy would gather them together at the end, and he'd say, we're going to pray. And today we're going to pray, like we do at my church. We ask for concerns, the things that we want to pray about. You tell me, and I'll pray for you. He said, I know that they went several months before anybody ever raised a hand, but finally one little girl raised her hand. And he says, how can we pray for you? He says, my cat has been gone for three days. Would you pray that my cat comes home? He got the name of the cat. He prayed for the little girl and the cat. A few weeks later, a little boy raised his hand. He said, how can we pray for you, son? He said, my dad's been gone for three weeks, and my mom doesn't know what to do. Would you pray that my dad comes back? You know, by the end of that school year, the parents were coming and standing in the circle at the end of choir practice, asking for prayer. Loy became a blessing to the community. Loy found a way to pray, even in a public school, where we say, you can't do that, you can't do that. And God, every time there's a barrier, God sends the Holy Spirit to go beyond the barrier if we're willing to listen to what God wants us to do. And so Loy pushed it beyond the barrier. Let me tell you the kind of 
the, 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 the sense of humor that God has. The second Christmas we're doing this, he comes to me and says, there's a little girl that can't sing in the Christmas concert, and I'm concerned. And I said, well, what's the concern? He said, if I can't pray, I'm not going to do this. So I'm going to go check because the mother gave permission. Public school now. He went to the mother and he says, why can't your daughter sing? You gave permission for her to sing. <laughs> and she said, we're Jehovah Witnesses. And he says, that's okay. What's, why, why Jehovah Witnesses? What, what difference does it make? She says, well, we don't believe in Santa Claus. He said, well, what about Jesus? Oh, she said, we love Jesus. We just don't like Santa Claus. He says, if we give up the Santa Claus songs, can, we go, can she sing? Oh, yes, that'll be fine. So we gave up the Santa Claus songs and sang songs about Jesus in the public school. It's all because somebody said, I want to bless the community. What keeps us from blessing the community? What would keep you from saying the blessing? May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you. And may the Lord give you peace. May you be on the right path so you become who God would have you be as God turns God's face upon you so you can have that deep and abiding peace so that whatever moment you are alive with whomever you're with, you can pronounce the blessing. So who's going to say the blessing?